Happy Martin Luther King Day. It's been nearly 60 years since I heard Martin Luther King deliver his famous uh, I Have a Dream speech. I was a 24-year-old law clerk on the Supreme Court. Uh, the Supreme Court term starts the first October, uh, first Monday in October. And so this was August of uh, 1963. And it was the interim um, between my first clerkship in the Court of Appeals and my second clerkship in the United States Supreme Court. But I was employed at this point by the Supreme Court of the United States. And I heard, like everybody else did, that Martin Luther King was coming to Washington to deliver a, a major speech on civil rights, and I wanted to go. But the Chief Justice of the United States, and this is a story that's not widely known, the Chief Justice of the United States, the great Earl Warren, who wrote just nine years earlier, Brown versus Board of Education, told the law clerks not to go to the Martin Luther King speech and told all court employees to stay away from it because there was a concern that the speech may result in arrests and the issue may come to the United States Supreme Court and law clerks uh, should not be witnesses to um, issues that come before the Supreme Court. So we get a pretty strict instruction to stay away from that speech, but I wanted to go. And, you know, I was a cocky young kid. And so I went back to my first judge, Judge David Bazelon, who at the time was chief judge of the United States Court of Appeals. And I said to him, Judge Bazelon, I really want to hear this speech, but I know that members of the judiciary were told not to go. What should I do? He said, very easy. Come with me. I'm going. I said, but you're also a member of the judiciary. You're a judge. He said, I make up my own mind about things like this. And, and so I went with him and we heard his speech. Of course, the most famous line in that speech is the subject of today's uh, podcast, where he said uh, in his dream, I dream for a day when my children will be judged by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin. And actually, I wrote a whole book about, about that. Um, my 47th and 48th book, uh, The Case for Colorblind Equality in the Age of Identity Politics. And in that book, I come out against um, uh, any race-specific uh, activities by the government, positive or, or negative. Um, and so I am personally hoping that the Supreme Court, uh, which has the case before it, a case involving both Harvard and the Harvard of private college and the University of North Carolina, a public college. And the issue is the same in both cases, but the answer could conceivably be different because obviously government universities uh, have different standards than private universities. Um, but the Supreme Court will decide this term, whether or not race can be taken into account in deciding a college admissions. Let me tell you my view. I'm sure your view may be different. Uh, I, I don't believe that um, college admission should be based solely on grades or scholastic aptitude tests or anything like that. It should be based on meritocracy, but meritocracy broadly defined. If a person has you know, done great things outside of the classroom or in some instances has served in the military um, or has, um, um, you know, is a great um, musician or a, a great chess player or a phenomenal actor. Um, I have no problem with the school taking any of those things into account. They can define meritocracy as broadly as they want. They can if they want to abolish the um, uh, SAT, scholastic aptitude test, they could do so. I'd be against it. I would not be in favor of it, but it wouldn't be unconstitutional. But the one thing you cannot do under the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution is to take into account a person's race and to use that as a deciding or even a, an important factor in admissions. Now, we all know that when it comes to negatives, because we had a horrible, horrible experience with that, obviously, starting with Dred Scott decision back in the um, 19th century when race mattered. Um, but even <clears throat> more recently in my lifetime, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> excuse me, the United States government made decisions uh, based on, on, on race. And I'm not only talking about segregated schools, segregated portions of the army, although that was wrong. 
But the worst example, probably, of using race was the Japanese um, detention. 110,000 approximately Americans, mostly American citizens of Japanese descent, some of them born in the United States, some of them born in, in Japan, were put in detention centers, not on the ground that they personally were disloyal or raised an issue of national security, but on the ground that they were Japanese. And that was enough. Uh, if you were Japanese, you went to the camp. Now, the camps were not concentration camps, not, nothing like, obviously, Auschwitz or Birkenau or any, anything like that. The people were treated somewhat decently. The problem is they lost their jobs. They lost their companies. Uh, a lot of them were truck farmers. Um, and, uh, but they were kept together as families. And, in fact, there was no decrease in, in population during the three or so years when they were held in detention, but what an insult to be told. You're an American citizen. Your brother may be fighting in Europe at the Battle of the Bulge, but you have to sit in a detention center because you're Japanese. And um, remember, this was also not a liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat thing. This was done by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, one of the most liberal presidents of the United States. It was supported by Earl Warren, uh, the man who wrote just a few years later, Brown versus Board of Education. It was supported by Abe Fortas, uh, a very liberal uh, uh, for future justice of the Supreme Court. It was supported by Hugo Black, maybe the most liberal in some respects, justice who ever served on the Supreme Court. It was extremely popular with Americans. Americans wanted to put the, quote, Japs behind bars. It's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. When we were kids, we used to sing racist songs about the Japanese people. They were, they were the devil incarnate. And look, the Japanese government certainly deserved to be condemned. Pearl Harbor was a, a war crime, a disaster. It killed many Americans. It was also one of the stupidest acts of war ever perpetuated. Um, um, it resulted in a change in everything. If America hadn't been bombed, it's very likely they never would have gotten into the Second World War. It's possible they would have. And if they hadn't gotten into the Second World War, who knows if the um, Germans might have won. The Russians were already in the process of defeating them once Stalingrad and some of the other events of the war took place. But it was a really, really dumb decision by the Japanese to bomb Pearl Harbor and get the United States involved in the war. Possible the United States would not have gotten involved. They had a very bad experience in World War I, lost a lot of young men to a war which made very little sense to a lot of people. Um, in any event, race was the deciding factor there. And that's why it was always surprising to me after Brown versus Board of Education that said that race could not be a factor in deciding who goes to what school. Um, you, you have to use race neutral uh, considerations that the Supreme Court. For years, uh, I got to Harvard in 1964, and we started debating race-specific affirmative action uh, early on then. And from the day I got to Harvard Law School, um, I was a liberal, maybe the most liberal person on the faculty at that point. I was categorically opposed to racial quotas. And, and people say, oh, no, 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 they're not racial quotas. They're not quotas. They're targets. Nonsense. They're quotas. There's no difference between a target and a quota. Um, Harvard and other schools uh, take approximately, in some cases it's 13%, some cases it's 12%, some cases it's 14%, but uh, of people who are African-American or Black, um, if that number ever went below, say, 5%, there'd be a, a revolution. Um, and so there's clearly, all right, you don't want to call it a quota, call it a floor. There is a point below which you cannot go in admitting African-Americans. And look, there are an extraordinary number of highly qualified African-Americans, particularly a school like Harvard has no problem filling its quota or going above its floor with extraordinarily well-qualified uh, students. But there are also other qualified students who are not admitted just because they're not black. And, and that's clear. Nobody will, will dispute that. So there are floors. 
But whenever there are floors, there are ceilings. There's no way to build a house with just a floor. You have to have a ceiling. And so if there are 13% quota or floor on African-Americans, there's going to be a ceiling <clears throat> on people from other groups. There's a famous story early on in the Affirmative Action Race-Specific Program. A group of Jewish professors, um, I was among them, um, met with the dean of admissions and various other people at Harvard. And uh, there was one famous uh, meeting, there were several meetings, there was one famous meeting where a professor, I wish it was me, it wasn't, I can't take credit for it, where one of the professors um, said to the dean of admission, you know, we've noticed that the increase in African-American or black applicants up from 2% to 8% or 10%, 12% has produced a concomitant reduction in the percentage of Jews so that Jews were 25%. Now they're 12% or 13%. And so what you're doing is you're taking the quota of black or African-Americans, by the way, I say black or African-Americans because there are African-Americans who are black, obviously, but there are also um, island Americans who are black and somehow some people don't consider them to be African-American, even though their origin obviously is in Africa. So I'll use both of those terms. Of course, today in America, you use any term you worry about being canceled. I don't worry about being canceled or criticized, but I don't obviously want to offend anybody uh, un unnecessarily. So the, the professor said, you seem to be taking the quota of African-Americans or blacks out of the quota for Jews. And, and the dean said, no, 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 there are no quotas, nothing like that. It, it's just that you have to understand we take students by region. And so if you get a region like in the Middle West, uh, we tend to um, favor uh, the inner cities of the region like Cleveland. So we'll more likely take applicants from Cleveland and then the the people in the periphery, in the kind of donuts around the city, like Shaker Heights and some of the suburbs, will suffer. And, and, and in New York, the same thing. We'll take more students from the inner city, and, and therefore the students from the donuts, uh, Westchester County and, and uh, uh, Southern Connecticut, et cetera, those donut students will suffer. The professor said, Dean, those aren't donuts, they're bagels, because the large percentage of people who were kept out as a result of the um, race-specific affirmative action program, which had a quota or a floor, the people who were disadvantaged by the ceiling tended to be Jews back then. Now it's totally different. Now the people who are really hurting uh, on the basis of uh, the lack of mer meritocracy uh, as, as compared to using race are Asian Americans, um, and they are the ones who brought this lawsuit. And the statistics are daunting. Um, if you're an Asian American, uh, you need a much higher score to get into Harvard than if you're black. If you're a Jewish American, you need a higher score as well, but not as high as you need if you're an Asian American. Now, the school justifies that by saying, we want to balance. We want to strike a balance. And I, I understand that. I was the beneficiary of that. I was actually the beneficiary of an unconstitutional discrimination against women when I applied to college. Now, I was not a good student. I was a bum. Um, I went to Yeshiva High School. I didn't like the rabbis. They didn't like me. Uh, we had like 49 students in our class, and I was, I think, 40th in the class. There were nine lower than me, but, you know, I was pretty low in the class. I had a lot of C's and uh, B minuses and and, and grades like that. And to get into Brooklyn College without a test, you had to get an 82 average if you were male, if you were a boy. But if you were a girl, a female, you had to have an 88 average. Maybe it was 87, but it was substantially higher. Why? Because if everybody who got an 82 or an 84 uh, were, were admitted, there would be twice as many females as males, because women just do better in high school than, than, than men do, than boys do. And, and so in order to create a balance, and when I went to Brooklyn College, it was about 50% male, 50% female. 
but the women were invariably smarter than the men. In fact, I think, I am not positive about this, but I think I finished 15th, 16th, or 17th in my class from Brooklyn College, quite, quite a bit of difference from high school. I had like 3,000 students in the class. So I was a very, I was a star student. And I think I was first among the male students at Brooklyn College, but I was only 16th among all the students. In other words, the 15 people ahead of me in the class were all women. And most of the best professors were women for the same reason. So anybody who's ever accused me of being a sexist, forget about it. I could never be a sexist. Having gone to a school where was, that was dominated and appropriately so by women who had a much harder time getting in. And uh, once they got in, they, of course, uh, excelled. So I was the beneficiary of that. If I had been a female, I don't think I would have gotten into Brooklyn College. And I, I probably would be shelling, selling shoes in Brownsville, Brooklyn uh, today, because without a college degree, you can't be a lawyer. So I, 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 I am the beneficiary of, of, of gender-based affirmative action. And, and I, it took me a long time to realize that. But just because I'm the beneficiary of something doesn't mean I approve of it. I don't approve of it. I think Brooklyn College should have taken everybody in on the same average. And if there were more females than males, so be it. Uh, and if there are more Asian Americans, um, then some ideal quota seems to think there should be, so be it. And um, But what if there are fewer African-Americans? Well, it just means fewer African-Americans at, at one particular school or two particular schools. Um, there, there are enough rooms and enough colleges today that every qualified student, regardless of race, can get into a good school. The question is, can they get into the best schools if they don't have the best grades? And, um, you know, we all want to make sure that in certain areas of life, meritocracy uh, prevails. Um, nobody wants to have a surgeon who was admitted based on race or gender. We all want the surgeon who was the best possible surgeon. Um, in my, my birthday a couple of years ago, um, I got a gallbladder attack on my birthday. I was on Martha's Vineyard and my whole family was with me, my grandchildren, my, everybody. Was, and I had to rush to New York for treatment. So we got on the first plane and it was the worst storm imaginable. And the plane just rocked back and forth. So usually it's a half an hour flight. This was well over an hour. And, it was, and everybody on the plane thought we might die. I would bet you that every single person on that plane, regardless of their own race, was saying, I hope this pilot was picked for his or her merit, not to satisfy some broad social policy program. So I think we all admit, if you're a surgeon, if you're a pilot, we don't want race to be a factor in the decision whether to get you qualified for the job. Should it be different if you're in another profession? Well, maybe um, lawyers. I don't think it matters that much, but you know, it certainly matters to the person who was rejected and turned down. Look, college admissions are complicated. Um, there are kids who apply who are very privileged. Um, they went to great elementary schools, very great high schools. They had tutors. And that should be taken into account. And if you've gone to a really elite high school and if you've been privileged and you've had tutors, maybe you should need a higher grade to get in than if you come from um, Appalachia and your parents uh, 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 got divorced at a very young age and, and they were on opiates and, and you really had to struggle. Yeah, I, I would take all those factors into account. That's part of meritocracy. And I would count where you are compared to where you've come from in terms of socioeconomic status. And that would benefit um, the minorities more than it would benefit my relatives and, and, and my friends' children and, and people of that kind. And that's fine. That's fine. But you just should not have specific quotas or targets that say how many people of a particular race have to be admitted to avoid controversy and putting a heavy thumb, and sometimes it's an elbow, on the scale based on, on race. And I hope the Supreme Court uh, understands that. And, you know, it was Justice O'Connor who some years ago said, well, there was really room for 
for race-based affirmative action, and maybe it should last another 25 years. Well, those 25 years have now uh, expired. And um, I think, and I hope, that the Supreme Court will leave enormous discretion to colleges, both public and private. Let them decide what factors are best to create a great class and a balanced class in different ways, as long as race cannot be considered. Race is irrelevant in these kinds of decisions. Now, people will say it's relevant because we live in a discriminatory society, but our goal is to make it irrelevant. Our goal is the case for a colorblind society or colorblind equality in an age of identity politics. You know, the Bible... <clears throat> instructs judges on two things. I think I've mentioned this before. One is don't take bribes. That's easy, but that comes second. The first one is lo takir panim. Do not recognize faces when you're a judge, which means do not recognize races, do not recognize genders, do not recognize ethnicities, recognize what's relevant. Now for college admission, there are a lot of things that are relevant beyond grades and test scores. But one thing that is not relevant is race. Why? Consider two applicants, one from Appalachia, uh, who went through all these issues that I've described and really struggled and struggled and struggled and ends up with, say, a 3.5 average, not a 3.7, and ends up with the grade, you know, Pretty high, but not very high. And, and then you get an African-American kid whose father is a senior partner at Goldman Sachs, whose um, mother is a, a lawyer at Cravath, Swain & Moore, um, whose uh, brother just had a startup company. Um, the applicant himself went to Dalton or fanciest schools, had tutors up the kazoo. Uh, is there any conceivable reason for preferring the privileged black kid to the unprivileged white kid? And if anybody tells you that doesn't happen today, don't believe it. It does happen. Now, the unprivileged white kid will get some benefit in some schools. And the privileged black kid won't get as much benefit, perhaps, as if she or he had come up from a, a much lower socioeconomic status. But race itself will tip the scale. And the Supreme Court has said previously that race can tip the scale. I think they ought to change that. And race should not tip the scale. It shouldn't be a pinky. It shouldn't be a thumb. And it certainly shouldn't be an elbow. And I'm going to get a lot of, a lot of pushback on this one. But this has been my position since I heard Martin Luther King's speech in 1963. And since I went to Harvard in 1964. And don't expect an 84-year-old man to change so quickly according to political correctness or the current winds of wokeness. So I'm sticking to my guns. I'm sticking to my principles. I wrote another book called The Price of Principle. And one of the principles that America should abide by, it wasn't founded on this, and we've had our problems with it. One of the principles is colorblind equality. Equality based on the quality of one's character, the content of one's character, broadly defined to include many, many factors, but not race in and of itself. So that's my view. I'm interested in what your views are and uh, whether you agree with me or disagree with me. Thanks. Uh, so let's, let's turn to some questions. Obviously, we talked a lot <clears throat> about um, <clears throat> classified material. We talked a lot about Santos uh, last week. So here's the first letter. It's interesting. I think it was meant as an insult. I take it as a great compliment. Sorry, Al, you are trying too hard to create nuance. Yes, I am. That's what I want. That's my middle name, nuance, calibration. Yes, I want to make sure that every decision is made based on a weighing of the factors on passing the shoe on the other foot test. Nuance, that's what we want. We don't want people to say when it comes to the classified material, oh, oh, Trump did nothing wrong at all and Biden did everything wrong or Biden did nothing wrong at all and Trump did everything wrong. No, they both did things that were wrong. Let's introduce a little nuance into that 
conversation. Let's introduce a little nuance into the conversation about quota systems and about affirmative action. So yes, I am trying very hard to introduce nuance and I hope you will agree with me. Okay, let's see what else there is on today's agenda. It's up to the voters to stage a recall if they choose to see if they're served by Santos's performance. Unfortunately, in the federal system, there are no recalls, there are recalls. In California, we saw the district attorney of San Francisco was recalled. There are other parts of the country where recalls are permitted. In some states, they are. Some states, they're not. California is big on recalls. They actually recall two justices of the California Supreme Court um, because they were against the death penalty. Uh, that was um, years and years and years ago. But uh, states have recalls. The federal government does not have a recall for, for Congress. So that's not a possibility. I, I don't see any real possibility of getting rid of Santos, except in the next election. I think probably he's going to have to be tolerated. The question is, what will the Republican leadership do with him? Will they marginalize him? Will they give him committee assignments? We now know that the Republicans, some Republican leaders were complicit in his lies. They didn't tell him to lie, but they knew about his lies and they didn't expose them and they didn't uh, do anything about it. And they allowed him to be nominated thinking he would win. And they were right. He won. Um, and, um, and the question is, can we do anything about it for the future? It's limited because the Constitution gives the House of Representatives the ultimate authority uh, in this regard. OK. Here's a guy. Uh, Biden as vice president can declassify documents he himself classified. Wrong. No, he can't. Only the president can declassify or there's a process of declassification. I don't think I'm not positive. I don't think the vice president has the power to classify. I think he has the power to recommend a classification. And of course, Biden very properly was subjected to classified material. He, as the vice president, is a national security officer and gets briefed, uh, if not every day, very frequently uh, on national security. And when you're briefed, you're given classified, sometimes really highly sensitive material. And so Biden had perfect right to have that material. The problem is he shouldn't have taken it with him and put near his Corvair in the, in the garage. That's the problem. Um, so Biden, as vice president, can declassify documents he himself classified. No, he can do it now as president. And Biden did the right thing, doesn't pass the sniff test. This process is very strange. Finally, ignorance is not an excuse. Well, ignorance sometimes is an excuse depending on the law, but the process is very bad. You know my idea for the process. No president, no vice president, no high-ranking official should ever have anything to do with what gets taken out of the office or the White House. There should be a special group from the National Archives that comes in and makes every single decision what leaves the White House. You don't get to take anything with you unless it passes that scrutiny. We've learned a lesson here. You cannot trust the outgoing president or the outgoing vice uh, uh, president. A, they have other things to do. They're busy and they get sloppy. B, some of them want to get material in their possession that helps them write their memoirs, like Sandy Berger. He never should have had access to that. Of course, he didn't take it home with him originally. It was in the archives, but then he put it in his sock. I, I knew Sandy. I liked him very much. And I, I'm sorry that his memory is tarnished in this way. Okay, here's a typical person uh, in the divided um, America that we live in. I just assume everyone but Trump is lying. Now, that's a really sensible approach. Everyone but Trump is lying. The result is, I don't watch, read, or listen to any news anymore. Okay, you have entitled to do that. But the idea that everyone is a liar but your hero, Donald Trump, mm -mm, that doesn't pass uh, any test, certainly doesn't pass the shoe on the other foot test. So here's the final question. So it would be permissible to claim that the Holocaust never happened, but not permissible to lie about one's military record because that would be insulting and demeaning. No, uh, it's permissible to say the Holocaust didn't occur because there are no such thing as historical libels or, or libels against all the people. And the same thing it is true. Uh, you can lie about your military record. What you can't do is lie about somebody else's military record. 
You can't point to Joe and say, oh, Joe, he didn't even serve in the army when he served. That would very much be defamation. Or you couldn't point to Elie Wiesel and say, he didn't survive the Holocaust. He's making it up. That would be def defamation. But defamation requires a specific victim in the United States, in other parts of the world, Canada, for example, Germany. Um, you can be prosecuted for uh, faking history. You can be prosecuted for uh, group libel. Uh, but the United States has chosen a different course. We want those libels and defamations and lies to be answered in the court of public opinion. We pay a heavy price for that, but I think it's a price worth paying. See you tomorrow.